Hey pals, we should chat. Come hang out with us on Twitter at Go With The Heat. Now if you excuse me, I'm going back to brooding over the waters of Biscayne Bay with my alligator at sunset. You enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're talking about Season 3, Episode 23, titled Everybody's in Showbiz, the penultimate second-to-last episode of Season 3. It's getting getting good now. We're getting to the end of the season here. (laughs) I I have a feeling there's some Very dramatic. Yes, very. (laughs) I have a feeling we're going to have some mixed reactions on this episode, but I'm just going to come out and say ahead of time, I actually kind of enjoyed this one, even though it wasn't good. I can't explain why. (laughs) <laughs> i don't know we're gonna have some definite interesting conversation at the end of this it originally premiered on may 1st 1987 it was written by reynaldo povode and i'm i hope i'm pronouncing that right this is the only episode he ever wrote he's a super successful playwright who won a ton of awards and unfortunately he died of AIDS at the age of 34 in 1994. So that also might be the influence of the um, artiste direction of the stage performances in this episode. It's written by a very successful playwright. That's true. That would make sense. <laughs> and also Dennis Koopa. <laughs> Koopa again? He also wrote it too. So which we know him from Made for Each Other, Sons and Lovers, The Good Caller, Streetwise, Red Tape. This is his last episode he wrote though. So he's been around a little bit. It is directed by Richard Compton. So again, another accomplished director, plus Reynaldo, he wrote and directed a ton of episodes Richard Compton did, including Down for the Count Part 1 and 2, and he's got like six more episodes coming. So both the writer and director have been around for a while, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, I can check in and see what's going on each other's lives. Guys, we've been plugging Vice Team movies. All season long. Seems like they all kind of piled up all at one time. We got Don Johnson being in a movie. We got Edward James almost being in a movie. And you know what? Olivia Brown is going to be in a movie. Big booty Trudy coming back to the movies. (laughs) (laughs) Woo! She's going to be in a movie titled Our Dream Christmas, which is... I'm going to read the synopsis here because this movie's crazy. There's all kinds of stuff happening in this movie. So here's the synopsis. It's Christmas Eve in Los Angeles, and hardworking Gabby, her husband, and their two kids, Amber and TJ, are fresh from Mississippi to spend Christmas with her mother and brother. With her mother dying, the family wanted to spend one last Christmas together. Over the course of two days, Gabby uncovers the truth about her wayward husband, defends herself against her sick, judgmental mom, (laughs) widens the gap between her preteen daughter and herself, and faces a potential job loss. That doesn't sound like a very good Christmas. Ratchet up the drama on this one. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to premiere on UMC, which stands for the Urban Movie Channel. So you're you're only going to be able to get it streaming. Disney should tell the Urban Streaming Channel, too, now that they're (laughs) buying Fox and everybody else. Yeah, I mean, they might as well. They they literally own their Hasbro away from owning my entire childhood. No, I don't know if they could make it. Hasbro better, though. Uh, Well, I'm excited the fact that they're basically reunite the entire Marvel Cinema Universe. But it makes me wonder what's going to happen with shows like The Simpsons, like some of the regular stuff like Gotham and and stuff like that. Like, is Fox just going to go away? I didn't even think about Gotham. That's a DC. Like, how's that going to work? But they didn't buy. They don't have anything yeah, on the yeah, channel, uh, though. But they bought the TV studio. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's so true, like yeah. where all the shows get made. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> so imagine that right now, Marvel Cinematic Universe is the prequel about Batman. <laughs> it's gonna get weird. Batman's finally be good again. <laughs> DC will be decent once again. Dude, first episode, Captain America shows up, beats the hell out of Batman. <laughs> I don't know how to feel about this deal because Disney is so powerful that they own all this stuff, including The Simpsons, which no matter how much you talk about Miami Vice or anything else, Matt Groening's work in The Simpsons and Futurama, my life revolves around those two shows. And now the mm-hmm. mouse owns The Simpsons. And I'm not like I I can't function knowing that that's <laughs> going to be a thing. <laughs> If you want to see before Disney has a chance to buy the Urban Movie Channel and you want to see Our Dream Christmas, guess what? UMC does a free seven-day free trial. 
And Our Dream Christmas lands on UMC streaming service today, the day that this episode came out. The movie is now on UMC, so sign up for that seven-day free trial. Watch the movie. Be sure to tweet at Olivia Brown. There's a link for her Twitter in our show notes and UMC saying that you watch the movie because we want to support Trudy. She's making a movie. Or it's- Olivia, her real name. <laughs> <laughs> Olivia Brown, true. We want to support <laughs> Olivia Brown. She's in a movie. You can watch it for free on the UMC channel. And you know what? After this, after watching the movie, you can cancel the free trial. It doesn't cost you anything. For zero investment, uh-huh. you can support Olivia Brown. Totally but make sure you... It. Totally. You let her know that you watch it and you let UMC know that way they'll put her in more movies. Exactly. You should get more work. <laughs> well, I'm sure it's not. Our dream Christmas is not as preachy as this episode of Miami Vice is, or as like hoity toity, I guess you could call it. Like, <laughs> hoity toity. I don't know how to phrase it because they're like reading poetry through the whole thing and stuff. Like, I don't know. A little off. Let's go talk about this episode. So we open up, and there's a limo driving, and right behind the limo, Sonny's following non. Descriptively, I mean, in uh, driving your fancy car, following behind. <laughs> There's only limo. one guy who has that car, not being fly at all. Rico's in the limo, and he's talking to, as we find out later, his name's Gallego. He's talking to him about crackers. Like they want to stop and get some crackers. Yeah. He's talking about like he wants some a bunch of different foods. He listed them off, and the guy's like, "We got to do a deal." Like, what are you talking about food for? <laughs> like, I'm hungry. I, I like, think I, I think he owned a car wash because he's talking about how hard they are to get out of a carpet out of upholstery. Really upset about these um. crumbs. <laughs> <laughs> he decides like, no, okay, let's go get these crackers right now. So he tells the limo to turn around and stop at a bodega, and then ask the limo driver to go in and go buy them some crackers. This is really how this episode starts. <laughs> and while they're stopped, two men who I thought was masked. Aren't but they masks? I they thought keep, too. They keep talking about how they have makeup no, on. No, it's I'm, masks. It's got to be masks, right? Yeah, because they're, they're matching. It's got to be. Yeah, because they talked the rest of the episode about how they had this fancy makeup on. That's how they knew that they were somehow it's associated gotta be like with It's got to be like fancy planes. masks is what they mean. It's not makeup. No way. So the limo stopped. Driver's in the bodega getting some crackers. <laughs> And these two men come walking up wearing the same mask, same build, and they get into the back of the limo. They're like, hey, this is someone we could rob. They climb into the back of the limo. Yeah. Pull Gallego and Tux at gunpoint. It almost seemed like it wasn't planned. Like they were just (laughs) wandering down the street like like, like they were heading to a a robbery. And then they saw the limo and they were like, oh, what are the chances? (laughs) We can just rob this person. But they talk about. Now we don't have to walk two more blocks. (laughs) <laughs> when they when they're walking up, they're talking about how they know who's in the limo. I didn't catch that part. Yeah, they're talking. They're like, "Oh yeah," you, and they're one of them is saying like, "We shouldn't do this," and he's like, "Oh, they always got money." And the other one's like convincing them. They're going back and forth for that short period of time. They're trying to say like, "Hey, we shouldn't do this," and the other one's like, "No, he's got money, and he he won't miss it." Basically, and then they get in the car. That's interesting. So that helps with the ending make a little bit more sense on how because. That would mean that Mikey has a plan the entire time that he that they were going to take this and that the papers mm-hmm. were worth money because Gallego tries to buy his way out of it. He says, here's 20 grand. You can get money out of the, the yeah. arm. It's just 20 grand sitting in an armrest. But the two gentlemen who climbed into the back of the limo are adamant they want the briefcase and they will not leave until they get the briefcase. And Gallego wants to fight clearly, for a little bit, but then gives in. And clearly, this is how Pulpin starts. Basically, they got the case with Maurice Wallace's soul in it now. <laughs> and in about two weeks, John Travolta and Sam Jackson are going to pay him a visit. <laughs> Meanwhile, Sonny's listening to the entire thing on the wire that Tubbs is wearing, but he can't make any sense of what's happening. The two guys get out of the back of the limo. They run off. Gallego yells off at them that he's going to kill them. And then he gets his driver. They climb back into the limo and just leave Tubbs out on the street. And we go to the opening credits. That don't even give him a ride home. It's not his fault. <laughs> Another successful vice sting. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Another deal in the books. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, the whole team is reviewing the case. Tubbs says whatever their case is and it involves that briefcase because he did not want to give it up. He says he turned green when they asked him for it. Whatever it is, it's his, it's Gallego's whole business that's inside of that briefcase. He's also a major so crack I got dealer. a question for you guys. I stopped watching the opening credits sometime around season two and I just kind of skip over them. <laughs> when I'm watching the episode, at what point did they put the close up of that chick's boobs in? At oh, the that's beginning? been in the whole time. That's been a long time. Yeah. Really? 
Okay. Really? Damn. <laughs> now. now I got to go back to watching it every time. <laughs> so they also talk about that guy. a major crack dealer because the makeup was quote unquote so professional. Gina and Trudy get a phone book and start looking up the very few places in Miami that do professional makeup that well. I still say they're mad. That what I, don't, I don't know. It, Unless they're like, may, maybe they're like glue on mustaches and that's not, and they're not actually a mask. It's just like glue on, but what's with their faces? They look like plastic. <laughs> I don't know. This is what I was talking about through the rest of the episode. They keep saying that, and Gallego will say it later, about the professional makeup that they were wearing. Whatever. <laughs> is that what they were looking up? I thought they were looking up crack dealer in the phone book. <laughs> <laughs> Picture of Sonny. <laughs> <laughs> so next, the ladies head over to this costume store. Now, John. This is a costume and makeup store, I imagine, if you ran one. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> because the ladies come in. While they're walking around, a ventriloquist dummy jumps out and scares the bejesus out of Gina, <laughs> which I think was on that. Like, they didn't tell her it was going to happen, so they get her real reaction. I was like, really her screaming. <laughs> <laughs> and then a man comes out in a wheelchair and says, they introduce themselves as police officers. He says, oh, yeah, that's right. You're here for my entire list. He wheels over to him, stands up and gets out of the wheelchair, goes behind the counter to get the list and hands it to Gina with a fake hand or to Trudy with a fake hand that falls off. And then he finds like, OK, I'll find I'll stop messing around. I'll get- <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone fed this guy after midnight. <laughs> He's just one slide whistle away from being John. <laughs> <laughs> this scene, we learned that Don Gallego's henchmen are basically the three stooges. <laughs> yeah, Gallego's trying to be like, we're going to go see a play and then we're going to see who took the case based on their makeup that they're wearing. <laughs> Because that sounds an awful lot like that's what Gallego's plan here is that they're just going to go to the playhouse and see who looks really good or similar in makeup. Yeah, I'd be like, that's the guy. <laughs> <laughs> so we head over to the playhouse. There's a man performing a one act show, a one man show on stage. It's a really small theater. So I think he's only performing it in front of the people that work there. I don't think there's actually any regular patrons that are there watching. Crockett is also this is there Crockett's too. Crockett's Tuesday night theater group. <laughs> improv (laughs) because as soon as the man's done his name is mikey crockett starts clapping he goes over and it's like hey what's up mikey and mikey's like hey crockett long time no see i've been rehabilitated why are you here talking to me (laughs) (laughs) right off the bat (laughs) but crockett doesn't buy that i think this whole episode i think crockett's trying to get trying to angle to like get a role in whatever their next production is and so i was tr- throughout the episode i was trying to guess what production that is at first it felt like they're at a production of uh, uh maybe a rent <laughs> crockett goes right for the throat he's like i know it was you where's the briefcase this matches what i've arrested for you for before just t- turn it over to me and mikey says get a warrant why are you even talking to me without a Damn, warrant he knows his rights <laughs> well you gotta make everything harder you must make us do what we're supposed to do <laughs> <laughs> so crockett calls tubs tubs comes over he walks in he sees mikey he's like yep yeah, i recognize that guy he was definitely the one that recognized his shoes and socks <laughs> yes, <laughs> the guy with the white socks <laughs> 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 and so now they have their warrant and they say, okay, Mikey, now talk. Where's the briefcase? And Mikey still won't cooperate, which is the theme for the rest of the episode. Mikey's just on some sort of death wish. And drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of drugs. Lots of lots of drugs. Crockett is pleading with him, too, the entire time. Like, just cooperate. From the very beginning, he's pleading with him. He never once like tries to play hardball with him. So it's another one of those people where Crockett yeah, is... But- has a soft spot for him. Squares up and down. He was ne- nowhere near that limo. Damn it. He never mentioned the limo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Later on, he's like, <laughs> what? I didn't say anything about a limo. Damn it. <laughs> After dancing around for a while, they arrest Mikey, drag him outside. Pito, one of the people that works there, is protesting really hard and super stressed out, which we'll come back to. <laughs> they get Mikey to the Ferrari. Mikey starts biting the leather seats inside of the, I mean, inside of the Porsche. And so then they take him over. They handcuff him to a pillar. And then they go serve their warrant and go start looking for the briefcase inside of the theater. 
Meanwhile, outside, Mikey is just reciting poetry or some lines from a play or something, just screaming them at the top of his lungs. The duo, meanwhile, they can't find the briefcase inside. There's too many hiding places. The building's really run down. It's like missing a whole bunch of walls yeah, and like, stuff, too. Yeah, it's weird. They do find Mikey's daytime Emmy, because apparently they'll <laughs> give those to anybody. <laughs> Golden Globe. <laughs> <laughs> so then they do a head outside. The Miami PD are arresting Mikey and they take him away. Then we head over to the jail where Crockett is interrogating Mikey. And again, yeah, but Crockett- before we go over to the jail, I think we need to address something. And that's as far as the guest stars in this episode is concerned. Mostly because our guest stars, almost every single one of them, are in multiple ice episodes but play different characters. In fact, this episode, pretty much the episode of most returning actors playing different characters. <laughs> the guy playing Mikey, his name is Michael Car- Carmine. He also plays Snake in Nobody Lives Forever. Paul Calderon plays Don Gallego. He plays three different characters in three different episodes. Also might remember him from Pulp Fiction as Saul. Koyi Mundi plays Pinejo. He plays three different characters in three different episodes. Mario Ernesto Sanchez plays uh, Paco. He's in five different episodes. as five different characters. Damn. And one of three... One of three actors in the uh, Miami Vice movie, David Joseph Martinez, is three different characters. Francisco Dura plays two different characters. It's pretty much the only guest star that doesn't appear in multiple episodes as different as a different character is Benicio del Toro, who's Pedo. His role in Pedo is basically just to look stressed out like he's going to pass out at any moment. Yeah, he doesn't do anything really. He also looks like he's about 12. He's so young. <laughs> uh, obviously, Benicio del Toro, I mean, just some really big movies, at least some really movies I love, you know, Sin City, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, The Collector, Affix, Snap, he played Che Guevara in Che. He's a Puerto Rican actor and super famous now, but I want to take you back in time. He's doing like bit parts when he when he did Vice. That was Vice was really the beginning of his acting career as far as TV and film. At the same time he was doing Vice, he did a movie a TV movie called Drug Wars. After that, he was in Madonna's 1987 La Isla Bonita music video. Mm. He would then make his Movie appearance in Big Top Pee Wee in 1988. Really? Okay, I missed that one. I missed that he was in that one. Yeah, yeah. So, and then he would play Dario in the James Bond movie, License to Kill, in 1989. Yeah, that movie's got stacked. That movie's got a stacked cast. Yeah, and I gotta go back and rewatch it after seeing all the people who were in And then after that, there were five movies that I've never heard of, and then he did The Usual Suspects, and pretty much just blew up from there. Like, The Usual Suspects in 95 was, like, the role that, like, his breakout role. And then after that, you know, it's just a collection of just fantastic movies. It was a hell of a start. I mean, you know, Pee Wee Herman and Madonna uh, (laughs) on your SMA. He has been in so many movies you'd be like okay yeah if you've been in a thousand movies some of them are going to be misses talk about the percentage of misses to wins in benicio del toro's (laughs) (laughs) career but he's been in some amazing movies we just won't talk about the wolfman oh please don't ever talk about that again (laughs) over at the jailhouse crockett is interrogating mikey and he's telling mikey how dangerous gallego is like i don't know why you're messing with this guy why you think you're going to get away with this, too. And Mikey just says, oh, well, everyone dies. So be it. And so they're not able to get anything out of Mikey. He says that he was making 20 grand a month. I'm assuming acting. And uh, Mikey makes a reference saying he make, he was making 20 grand a night. Uh, I guess we're supposed to assume robbing drug dealers. I okay. guess. My question is, who the hell was paying them 20 grand a month to act? <laughs> I know. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, you think that if he was making that kind of money doing that level of acting, like that's a hundred and twenty thousand dollars or well, two hundred and forty thousand dollars well, a year. Later on when he gets bailed out by his agent, his agent's like, You're done, like you're you're washed up, but he had done something. I don't I don't understand this yeah. episode at all. Because like, they don't actually talk about what he's done, except for that he's trying to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> An autobiography that he can't write. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he can Xerox, okay? <laughs> so dad decides, Switek, you're going to go undercover and go work at the theater. And then we're going to do surveillance on the theater to figure out where what Gallego was up to. Because he's going to come around eventually. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Switek, take your magic act on the road. <laughs> I know. I mean, you think they would have, like, I think it would have been better if they tried to put one of the ladies in it or something than him. Zlytek has no hey, 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 discernible hey. talent. <laughs> Credit to Zlytek in this, because the next thing he goes over to the theater, he just walks in like, hey, I'm a guy down on my luck at, straight out of Kansas State. I'll help pay for food. And they're like, welcome aboard, brother. <laughs> yeah, he's like, my dad, I, I'm running away from my dad. I just got out of jail. My dad just died or something. It's like, okay. <laughs> He didn't even submit a resume. They just hired him on no, the spot. No, but I think what you're supposed to get out of this is that because Mikey was down on his luck and then he turned his life around, he started that theater for people like him. So they help people like but him. But they turned him away until he said he'd be willing to pay for food. <laughs> they didn't say anything. They're like, okay, whatever. Hey, apparently to join that theater group, they will accept money or sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> but it was kind of like, why are you telling us your life story? <laughs> Cool. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, uh, so right th- after this th- next part is the part that bothers me because Don and his guys come crashing in mm-hmm. and the whole time he's doing his little speech about how he's gonna kill them if he doesn't get his briefcase back. I think is trying hard to keep his back turned on. Yeah, like, he do, won't look do at not see my face. Like, yeah, like if I ha- if I look at him, then I have to deal with it. But if I don't look at him, it's not happening. <laughs> So the whole thing is weird too. Now Gallego shows up and he's got you know, he's got the muscle in there. He's got armed men. They're they're with fully automatic guns. They're threatening everyone in there that if you don't get me my briefcase in 24 hours, then I'm gonna start killing people. And then you, Cañejo, if you don't get me it in three hours, I'm gonna kill you. And he does all that while he's got his finger in Cañejo's mouth. <laughs> it's not awkward at all. Nothing says dominance like having your finger in someone else's mouth <laughs> outside the vice team or the duo have been sitting out there they've been watching guy- that guy go went in they don't know what's happening but they do know that he was in there and then they see G- guy go leave they g- immediately get a call on the car phone saying that mikey has posted bail too so he's gone we head over to the jail and we see that mikey's walking out with his agent and john this is the scene that you were talking about his agent's super upset says you already got an advance for writing an autobiography and mikey says the word it'll come to me eventually <laughs> I mean, you're writing a book about yourself <laughs> um it's about you like, should just be on the come top on, of your man, head don't make me do <laughs> the agent then says mikey is pathetic and tells him to grow up and then Mikey says, fine, then I'm not going to write a book. You'll have to harvest my organs to get the money out of me. <laughs> and then we jump to my favorite scene of the episode. We head over to the park. It's raining. Thunder clouds in the distance. Crockett's Thunder practicing his monologues. Rolling. Crockett reading poetry. The camera pans out. And you see Mikey in the background. And Mikey picks up the poetry next. And they have like a little poetry jam in the park. <laughs> Crockett and Mikey. <laughs> and I'm Tubbs in this episode. Well, Mikey what the hell only going knows on? how to over- <laughs> react <laughs> yeah <laughs> Crockett then tries to convince mikey again to cooperate and mikey flips out and says this quote soul is slogging through oatmeal well, and then okay. stumbles away as if his leg there's something wrong with his legs <laughs> <laughs> it's not the legs it's not the legs it's the brain <laughs> i do appreciate though that the vice directors here and the team behind it made sure they put in the thunder sounds while crockett was reading the poetry <laughs> to add for the effect because there was no actual thunder <laughs> I'm telling you, Croc is auditioning hard for Mikey. Like, he's hoping he's... He had to have been in, like, Crockett's favorite TV show. And, like, Crockett thinks he's going to get a role on it. Because, like, <laughs> why else would you stare off in the distance and start into a monologue with a, with a suspect? I don't know. It's I think it's this soft spot that Crockett has for Mikey for some reason. He explains a little bit of, of it later, but... But that's it. There's, like, no other explanation for why that he, bu- he busted <laughs> I, I him. Croc is swinging and missing, assuming that he's going to tap into his artist side. He really should be playing toward his crackhead side. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple of fast scenes here where Cooper is talking to Gallego and he wants to set up a hundred key order, but Gallego says he's retired until he gets his case. So 
no point in talking to me at the precinct. Yeah, dude, tell- Rico's like, like, what, what, what are we going to do business? Like, what the hell happened to that? <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm not doing anything until I get my mac and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> they go tell dad what's happening. And dad just says, well, go push on Mikey harder and go see if he can crack. Just keep Switek in the loop. What's happening over at the playhouse. <laughs> the duo show up. They come in and Switek. All right. Let me set this up a little bit better. It's black. There's a spotlight in the middle of the stage and a separate spotlight on a small boom box. The boom box starts playing music. And then out comes Switek dressed as Elvis, singing an Elvis song and not doing like an interpretation of it. He's just doing an impersonation of Elvis. Yeah. His hero, Elvis Presley. Yeah. Yeah. And then Mikey comes running up on stage, flips out. He's like, I'm going to show yeah. you how to do Elvis. <laughs> Elvis wasn't in Hamlet. I don't know what Switek was thinking. They're doing a Hamlet performance. <laughs> That's all he could do, okay? Either that or take his finger off. <laughs> <laughs> then we get into the hardest thing I've ever had to describe as host of this podcast in Mikey's performance of what Elvis is. I don't know what the hell is going on. I First, he takes an entire bottle of pills. Then he gets one of the stagehands to lay down and he cries over him as if he's his dead mom. Yeah. Then he gets up, starts shaking a whole lot and then drops on the ground. And the stagehands come running over and tell Crockett to call an ambulance. Which they don't do. Which they don't do. Because in the next scene, he's laying in his own bed. <laughs> and Crockett's like trying to persuade him again to do the right thing. So here, here's what, here, here's where I'm split with that scene. Mikey's like performance was all crackheaded out and and <laughs> weird. And it didn't make any like sense at the same time like when I, I trying to look at it from a distance i get what they were trying to do you know elvis famous huge performer and then he got into drugs at the end of his his life started abusing prescriptions and then it got all yeah. fat you know in a way they're trying to like mikey who's apparently supposed to be a halfway decent actor who's now fallen in with the crack <laughs> epidemic, you know, like, like almost he, like he was, he was mimicking Elvis, but really he was just do, acting as himself. But it's so hard on the actual performance to, to get anything out of that. Cause the whole time I'm just saying like, like what the hell is going on? <laughs> He's cracked out. That's what I kept thinking. <laughs> Go back yeah. to my text singing. <laughs> I know. Like that's a, all I kept thinking of was like that's nothing like Elvis. Like you don't even <laughs> sound like him. <laughs> so then when they don't take Mikey to the hospital, they just take him upstairs. Crockett wakes Mikey up by reading to him like his own writings, right? Yeah, his own, Ma- that's, that's his autobiography. Own, own writings, yeah. I think, yeah. But Mikey's still not cooperating, so Conejo tells Crockett, let me talk to him. We were locked up. We have a special connection. <laughs> oh, I bet Wink. they do. <laughs> <laughs> we were locked up together. Let me try and talk to him. So everyone leaves the room. Mikey gets up and pulls a briefcase out of a hole in the wall, which is like a fake switchboard or something that's covering it up. Pull that down, pulls out the briefcase. He takes one paper out and says... With with Conejo trying to convince him, like, we can make a lot of money off this. You just have to let me take care of this. There's something wrong with your brain. Let <laughs> me finish this up. <laughs> and Mikey says, no, I got this. I'm going to run off to the moon. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> See, <laughs> these are the crackhead deals. Rico, uh, uh, Rico and Crockett should be just, like, offering them, like, 350 and <laughs> and a pack of cigarettes. And they could have gotten the briefcase back already. <laughs> And Melissa, from Kanyeho's perspective, why you were saying like, why isn't he more concerned? They were basically saying, we're going to kill you if you don't find, give us a briefcase in three hours. He stuck his finger in your mouth, dude. <laughs> you should be worried about being dead. <laughs> but he's like, hey, we could get a lot of money. So I do have a question, though, because they never actually say, is he the one who pulls off the robbery with him and, with the, and robs the briefcase? That, I'm what pretty it, sure that that's, that's what, what it is. is yeah, right. them two together yeah, did the robbery, too. Because for some reason, I had thought it was always Benicio. And then I'm like, no, he didn't do anything because he's too square. And obviously, no, he's too tall. No, he's way yeah, too, he's square. too tall, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Over at the precinct this late at night, Crockett's telling Tubbs the first time he busted Mikey and that Mikey sent him a thank you note after he got busted and then tickets to his first play when he got out. So he has like some special connection with Mikey. Because Crockett is the worst judge of character. (laughs) But Tubbs, like always, 
sees right through it. He's like, that's cool, Crockett. I know you're a terrible judge of people. (laughs) By the way, a junkie is Mm -hmm. always a junkie. Why are you falling for this? Yeah, he's a junkie. (laughs) What I've been saying the whole episode, that he's a junkie and he's not even talented. (laughs) At the Playhouse... So White Tech goes over to talk to Pito, and Pito had found the case, and he has all the paperwork out. And he's saying, Mikey's in trouble. He sees what all the paperwork is. So White Tech picks up one of them and finally tells Pito that he's a cop. That undercover thing that they were doing, turns out all they had to do was ask Pito. <laughs> yeah, so, I know. By the way, is Pito cooperate. supposed to be slow? <laughs> no, I think he's supposed to be really young. He's like a kid. Like he kept calling. He keeps calling him a kid. So Isaac then calls Crockett and tells him that he found the case, but it's just copies. He thinks that Mikey's on his way to go sell some copies too. So that means Mikey's going out to see Gallego. Out on the road, out in front of Gallego's place, Mikey stops Gallego's limo and he says, "I can take you your briefcase." He gives him an example, a copy of one of the pages, and Gallego's like, "Yeah, it's cool. Why don't you hop in the trunk and take me to it?" Yeah, crack, Mikey, crackheads ride the trunk. <laughs> Don't worry, Mikey. Hop in. Your partner's in the back. They open up the trunk and Kangejo's dead body's in the trunk. And suddenly, Mikey has a different perspective and different tone when he talks to Gallego. It's like, buddy, how? Yeah, but he spits on his friend. Mm-hmm. Like, like, we, we could have made money. <laughs> <laughs> we had him. That's what Mikey says. And then he's like, Gallego, come on, man. You know, it's just playing. Yeah, I was yeah. never going to do anything to you. Come on. Oh, yeah. Like, he's just <laughs> realizing now that he's going to be killed and fed to like alligators or something. <laughs> Surprise. He does get stabbed, thrown into the water and left for dead. At the precinct, the duo, Switek and Castillo, who put together from the copies that they got from Pedo, that Gallego is using funeral homes the crack and he's laundering the money through those f- funeral homes as well so castillo says go get the warrants we can make a move on them now this next scene bothers me just because of circumstance we see crockett and tubbs sitting in the ferrari and they hear someone scream and camera pans back and we realize they are parked just a few feet away uh, <laughs> from where mikey's body was stumped after being stabbed and it's like wow that's a convenient place to park for them, you know? I mean, did they just take lunch there and just get lucky? <laughs> it's the perfect spot for them to shortly and a brisk walk, make it over to see Mikey, who is not in the water anymore. He is on a boat. He has somehow climbed up onto the boat that's right there and also not dead. Yeah, he's totally alive. Because <laughs> you can get stabbed and then not drowned. <laughs> Pull yourself out totally of the water. Ruin their lunch, though. Yeah, also, <laughs> like, from where they were sitting in the car, they could have seen him if they just looked that direction. <laughs> I'm like, that's what I told them. I'm like, how come they did not see him? He's right there. He's, like, in, within eye shot of where you're sitting. But you're talking it's in the just front. over there. Oh. Once again, masters of surveillance. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just don't look toward the water. Nothing ever happens on the water. <laughs> The ambulance comes, they take Mikey, preemptively put him in a plastic bag, <laughs> yeah, as you like, notice, Wilson. <laughs> yeah, why is he in the, pr- the, just in case you die on the way, we're going to put you in this, but we're not going to zip it up. <laughs> just keep your head out, but we have a bad feeling about you. So I, I want to make sure that I have less work when we get there. That's a plastic bag, <laughs> clearly. Oh, no, no. It, it's like, this guy smells, man. Put him in a body bag and we just yeah, exactly. zip it up. I have to breathe it. <laughs> so now the vice team are ready to make their move on Gallego. They got all the evidence that they need. They're all posted up over at the Higher Life Funeral Home, I believe is what it's called. <laughs> Which is a very <laughs> weird name for a funeral home. Don Gallego and-, and his guys are just casually burning evidence. <laughs> well, they can see the smoke coming out of the smokestack. So Tech sees Gallego get a shoe out of the trunk. Like, we can't wait for backup because it's just the vice team that's there right now. We got to go make our move. We can't wait for backup to show up. And this is when Zwitek becomes John Rambo. <laughs> he killed everybody. <laughs> they go running in. Shootout starts. Zwitek shoots and kills two people. Yep. And arrests a third. Uh-huh. Tubbs busts one. Crockett doesn't do shit except for roll around. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies even bust someone, too, as he's trying to run away. The shootout starts really fast, too. Like, they're... 
it immediately turns from freeze to everyone's dead. And my favorite shooting death of all time was the first person to get shot where he throws his arms up like he's on a roller coaster. <laughs> With the gun. Uh, <laughs> tech shoots him. Just like Vice, you know, it, it trying to end the episode with a gun battle, but we get a little different because they actually arrest a few people too, including the Don, which I thought for sure was going to be shot and killed. So when they come in, Gallego is trying to stuff everything, which apparently things I learned today is that when they cremate a body, they just stuff them in a cardboard box and then feed that into the whatever the yes. fireplace yeah, is. Yeah, the, the crematorium. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So they got these body-sized cardboard boxes. They're filling it up with the crack and they're going to burn it. The duo get there too late to stop them from burning the drugs, but they get there in time to see that Conejo's body hasn't been burned yet. I wasn't sure if Conejo had been killed or not at this point. So my thought was, was that that he was just knocked out in that box and they were going to burn his ass alive. But then he never came back in the episode. So I'm sorry. I, I <laughs> no, guess no, maybe you're right. No, because remember, he was, he was also knocked out. If, if that was the case, he was knocked out for hours, like two days. Because he's in the trunk of the car with blood. Maybe they hit him really hard. <laughs> also, what did you think they did when they put bodies in the crematorium? They just like suck him in there with like a poker or what? I thought they put him in a casket. No, the car. We didn't get to pay for a cat. Why would you waste the casket? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna pay for a casket just for them to burn it up. I want a fancy ass cremation. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, they put him in the flammable cardboard box and they they, they sprinkle it. No, I'm just kidding. With, with lighter fluid. And put you in I there. want you to put me in a full size casket and a bunch of crack cocaine. Actually, I don't even think they put you in a cardboard <laughs> box. I thought they just slid you in. Like your body in. I don't know. I'm wearing all kinds of things. Yeah, today. like naked. <laughs> <laughs> I want some titties. <laughs> Leave my underwear on. <laughs> well, luckily they got there in time. They they're able to get evidence on Gallego. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still laughing. And John thought he was knocked out. <laughs> Sorry, because that moment in this episode just showed up where you see Cognito's body. Yeah, so I was like, we're watching it on the screen. And I'm like, he's totally dead. And Crockett does oh, get there. Yeah, I, thought just get, I thought they were going to burn him alive. Like, poor crackhead. And then Crockett gets to Gallego just in time before he's able to flee this, the area. So they've now caught at least three people, four people, sorry, five people, because they busted two people. Only two people got shot. They may not even be dead. So that just... Good job. Good job, Vice. <laughs> yeah. And the episode. All right, let's get to music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. There's one last scene in the final scene of the episode. Crockett and Tubbs show up wait. at the hospital. They're talking to the doctor. The doctor says, we've done everything we can. World's worst doctor. <laughs> I don't even think you looked at him. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one last scene. It, it just kept going and going, and I kept thinking, why is this not over yet? <laughs> Crockett and Tubbs are there. They want to find out how Mikey's doing. Doctor says they've done everything they can. So then they go in and go see Mikey, and Mikey says, "No, I don't want to." No. Mikey asks the doctor to go get the uh, pigs so the he can talk to pigs, them. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. He actually sorry. called them pigs. Yeah, and he also asks the priest to go get them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mikey says, I was born poor and bloodied, essentially. I don't want to die that way. And so Grok is like, let's give him some money. He does the whole fake like pocket <laughs> I check. Don't have any, sorry. And he looks at Tubbs. <laughs> Tubbs comes over and slips Mikey like five hundred dollars in cash. What, why does Tubbs have so much money? Dude, Tubbs is looking at Crockett with uh, with like a death stare, like you son of a bitch. <laughs> Give it, and he he gives him the money, knowing because remember he's the one that said junkies are junkies, like yep. like they don't change. All right, and so he gives him reluctantly gives him the money, staring at Crockett, like knowing that he's just gonna break out and score crack later with it. And he even tells the nurse, hey, after <laughs> this guy kicks it, I want my money back. I thought that was so funny. He's like, yeah, make sure I get my money back. The nurse is like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm going to take that money. So, so dead. and guess what? Episode's still not over. He breaks out and scores crack. <laughs> <laughs> they leave. Crockett says, poor guy, he's not going to make it through the night. Crockett, bleeding heart. 
his friend from prison <laughs> friend is, from prison. <laughs> is not going to make it. <laughs> then as they're driving away from the hospital, Tubbs reads a line from somewhere. From his book or something. That basically says, junkies are always junkies. And Crockett's like, oh, shit. Yeah. Whips the, the Porsche around, drives back to the hospital. That's when we find out. Mikey had busted out, stole a bunch of drugs out of the pharmacy, and then fled with Tubbs' money. And then Crockett turns to Tubbs and says, yes. will you take a check? <laughs> <laughs> money <laughs> order? <laughs> like a crackhead will do. <laughs> and that's the end of the episode, which I think, now that we've gone back through this episode, the point of this was supposed to be another Crockett bleeding heart episode that he just bad judge of character he really believes in rehabilitation always gives people a second chance and he gets taken advantage of again i think that's, that's supposed to be the point of not this just episode. the women not just the ones he bones with <laughs> yeah he he's a terrible judge down. of character with guys too <laughs> so this episode is another one that's like it was last week where it feels like a little off too there was something a little different about this as we're ending the season so I'm I'm not gonna hide it. Like it was okay. I thought the the, the episode was all right. It was pretty good. I'm not gonna hide it. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tell my wife I say hello. <laughs> I'm from the neutral planet. <laughs> I was just saying, like it was it was good. There was some awkward parts of it, but I'll, I'll get more into it in my final thoughts. Let's go talk about this week's music, which is even weirder <laughs> than what this episode was. Let's go talk about the music. All right, John. So if last week was the week of the returning music, this week is something totally new. So this better not be coming because <laughs> every song is by the same person and that person's not very interesting. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> we have the songs The Leader, Vision, and What About Me by Chris DeBerg. A.K.A. Christopher John Davison. That's and even better. That's not even his real name. <laughs> Christopher Berg's not even his real name. He's a British-Irish singer, songwriter, and instrumentalist. His style is known as art rock. Basically, the music is supposed to be uh, like some kind of performance. I, I, I don't know, guys. <laughs> uh, uh, kind of peeked at the music next week and it's going to be almost all the same artists too and i'm getting scared I, I, i'm scared for where my music is going uh, let me tell you a little bit about chris de Berg. he had several top 40 hits in the uk he had two top 40 hits in the u.s most of his popularity or most where he charted was in norway and brazil huge in norway they love him in Norway. <laughs> He's most famous for his 1986 song, The Lady in Red. His song, The Lady in Red, went number one in several countries, so it by far was his biggest hit. He's actually sold over 45 million albums worldwide. Once again, he was huge in Norway and Brazil. <laughs> um, and, and He was actually born in Argentina. His dad was a colonel and British diplomat, his mom an Irish secretary, and his dad actually had considerable farming interests. He spent most of his early years in Malta, Nigeria, and Zaire before the family finally settled down in uh, Bargy Castle in County Wexford, Ireland, which was castle is actually his grandfather had bought and fixed up into a hotel in the 60s. And where Chris, when he was young, used to perform for guests. Once he actually, after completing college and earning himself a Master's of Arts degree in French, English, and History, he got his first grip contract in 1974, supported Super Tramp on their Crime of Century tour. I'm listening. Uh, basically, I love Super Tramp. Yeah, not bad, not bad. His early success, he was charting... Mostly in Europe and South America. Like I said before, he was big in Norway <laughs> and Brazil. <laughs> it, in the 1980s is when he would have his success in the UK and his small success in the US. Eventually falling back on the fact that he was big in Brazil and Norway. <laughs> and he's, he still performs now. He's, uh, he, he's big in Brazil and <laughs> Norway. <laughs> <laughs> a, a few things you might not know about him 
is his daughter Rosanna was the 2003 winner of the Miss World competition. Oh, uh, damn. She won representing Ireland. The next thing you might not know about him is in, in 1994. Allegedly. He had an affair with a 19 year old nanny while his wife was in the hospital recovering from a broken neck after a horseback riding accident. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh-huh. He wins. That's a pretty. Uh... <laughs> In 2011, he sold some bottles of wine from his wine cellar for over half a million dollars. And so, for some reason, that's kind of a big deal. And a big <laughs> enough deal to make it in his biography. <laughs> so, and I, I should really be careful with what I say about Chris DeBerg. Because apparently, he has pursued and won 16 defamation actions. So, uh, <laughs> wow, <laughs> doesn't take criticism well. It really doesn't. It doesn't. If you have that, Chris, but, we love you. I think he makes, <laughs> yeah, he makes fantastic music. Go out and check out his albums. <laughs> he's, he's incredible. Um, and, and obviously he's incredible because he's big in Norway and Brazil. <laughs> and he's not at all a cheater either. <laughs> So there's your music. Oh, man, this one went way off the rails that I thought where it was going to go. Because when I saw that it was the same guy, the three songs that I listened to the songs, I'm like, oh. They're not good. <laughs> why, why couldn't they just have Jan Hammer do this music? This <laughs> sounds just like Jan Hammer music. Why'd they have to bring in someone else to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go talk about our final thoughts on this episode. All right, I'm awesome. Why don't you kick us off this week? What are your thoughts on this episode? I hated this episode. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sorry. I hated it. It was awful. (laughs) That's the first time I've ever said that, I think. I hate this episode. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. He's not a good actor. His autobiography was going to be terrible. He's a junkie. (laughs) We get it. (laughs) I didn't need to hear his poetry that he didn't even write. That wasn't even poetry. (laughs) Tubbs was right the whole entire time. And he's like, why do I have to keep going with this chump? And (laughs) why does it cost ever? And he never got his money back either at the end. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it it did provide some funny, obviously some funny material with Switek being Elvis. And that was about it. (laughs) I won't be so critical (laughs) on the episode. (laughs) I actually kind of enjoyed it. Yes, there's these awkward points where you're supposed to think that Mikey is like the greatest living actor. He's won all these awards and he gets all these deals. and He makes all this money and you get these moments where he's supposed to be acting like when he's chained to the pillar while they're investigating the uh, the playhouse or when he does his Elvis impersonation slash acting. You're supposed to think that he's like the greatest li- living actor, at least the best in Miami. Which might be true, but <laughs> I'm sorry, Miami. I'm sorry. Impossible because Izzy Moreno is uh-huh. the Please. greatest actor on the planet. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I'm serious. Just check out his Facebook. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He doesn't hold a candle to Izzy, so can't be. But I did enjoy this episode because of what I said. It's that character study on Sonny and how much of a bleeding heart he is and how much he believes in when someone reaches out to him and says, thank you, or I've been rehabilitated. He wants to believe them and he always gives them the benefit of the doubt and he always gets burned. <laughs> but no matter how many times he gets burned, he's always willing to give people the benefit of the doubt and think that they've actually turned their life around. Like I mentioned at the end of our rundown and see, seeing it again and going through it in my mind like this is exactly what this episode is about, not about the actor. It's about Sonny and how he develops a relationship with the people that he works with on the streets. And he trusted Mikey and Mikey burned him, but he tried to do everything he could to help Mikey. That way he could stay straight. So I enjoyed it when I look at it from that perspective, regardless of how good of an actor Mikey actually is. <laughs> Mikey's not a good actor. Just saying right now. John, what are your final thoughts? So I'm going to go a little bit on the opposite side of you. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate the episode, but I, I don't think it's a good episode. I'm a little tired of Crockett looking like an idiot. 
<laughs> and give him a break. He, he's a vice. He's a drug cop. He deals with crackheads daily. He should know what to expect when dealing with a pair of crackheads who stole a drug dealer's briefcase. This was not going to turn out well, and it, it was just weird. It, it's just weird to me how gullible Crockett is, especially when it's with people who are drug addicts. Like you would think you would know better. That aside, like Melissa was saying, guy's a terrible, terrible actor. <laughs> Told you. <laughs> Our guests are all retreads from other episodes, like they were just hanging around the set one day. <laughs> it's tough. And once again, we got an episode. It just feels like Tubbs is in the background. Like he's just kind of, he's just kind of there, not doing anything in the episode. He's just kind of there. And I guess the last thing we'll say is, Christopher, please don't sue me. I didn't mean any of that in the music <laughs> segment. I love your music. <laughs> Well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go With The Heat. We would love, love, love to hear from you. Email us, heat at gmail.com or tweet at us at go with the heat. You can get us on Facebook, facebook.com slash go with the heat. Reach out to us, talk to us. Let us know what you think on this episode in particular. Let us know if you think that Pito would have been the better lead than Mikey. <laughs> Just saying, like they had an A-list actor there. They Maybe they could have leveraged him somehow. Let us know what your thoughts are on this episode. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com, Twitter at go with the heat, Facebook.com slash go with the heat. Be sure to check out the website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us. You can also find all the ways to subscribe. We have some upcoming fantastic rundown shows co coming for you. One, we have a season three recap and a look forward to season four. So that always happens. And then we're going to do another episode where we have, we're going to run down some of our favorite moments. And we're going to introduce something new that we're working on. As I mentioned last week, my advice only has five seasons and we are about a year away from ending our rundown on Miami Vice and we would love to do some more shows. Go to the website, go with the heat.com, click on support, see all the ways that you can support us, including leaving us a review on your podcast of choice, contacting us. And if you'd like some extra steps that you might be able to do to show us your support and let us know how we can proceed and where we should go because we're going to start talking about this real serious be sure to check out the website go with the, go with the heat.com and click on support and you can find all the things that i'm talking about that's going to do it for us this week we hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see y'all next time bye pal <laughs> <laughs>